Hello, and welcome to the New York State Archives webinar on using the eGrant system. The eGrant system is used to apply for and manage grants from the Local Government Records Management Improvement Fund, or LGRMIF program. This is number three in a series of webinars on the LGRMIF program. The other webinars are LGRMIF Grants Introduction, number one, Shared Services, number two, Project Narrative, number four, LGRMIF Application Forms and Tips, number five, and Minority and Women Business Enterprises Program, or MWBE, number six. Your presenters are Mark Monyak, the head of the Grants Administration Unit, and Sarah Derling, the Regional Advisory Officer for the Western New York Region. In this webinar, we will look at the various sections of the eGrant system that are part of the application process, including getting a user account, navigating the eGrant system, and forms that are particular to submitting an application. A separate webinar will cover managing a grant that has been awarded. Webinar number five, LGRMIF Application Forms and Tips, also covers forms. At the end of this presentation, we will list where you can access more information and submit any questions you may have. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the world of eGrants. The eGrant system was introduced in the 2010-2011 LGRMIF grant cycle replacing the paper-based system. eGrants was designed so that the applicant could manage their grant from application to final reports, all in one convenient location. This includes all parts of the initial application, any amendments and or requests for additional funds filed during the course of the project, and all final reports required at the end of the project. Please note that the eGrants portal is separate from the New York State Grants Gateway and requires a separate user account from the Gateway. This webinar will only address the sections relevant to completing and submitting an application. These parts include the narrative section, the project budget, forms required as part of the application process, and attaching items to the application. Since the application process is solely conducted through the eGrant system, all applications must be submitted electronically. Before we explore the system itself, however, we will discuss how to get access to eGrants. For that, we will look into getting and managing a user account. A user account is needed to access the eGrant system and we will look at user accounts over the next few slides. The account is set up through the New York.gov ID slash New York State Directory Services system. Only one account is allowed per institution, and that account is set up only through the institution's Records Management Officer, or RMO. To request a new account, your RMO or designee, where an RMO is not required or specified by law, must register for an account. The online registration form is available through our website on the LGRMIF web pages. We will provide an address for that at the end. We strongly recommend that you request a new account at least two weeks before the application deadline. There is a posted deadline for requesting a new account, and requests made after that deadline will not be processed. Check the current application guidelines for the specific deadline. There is no deadline for requesting a reset of an existing account, but we strongly encourage you to not wait until the last minute for a reset. More on that later. I'm not sure I have an account. Since most people only access eGrants a few times a year, they often forget whether they have one. If you are unsure, contact the Grants Administration Unit at ArchGrants at nyse.gov. But we also strongly recommend that you maintain records regarding your user account, including your username and password, especially the username, since that will not change or need to be updated. You can save yourself some time and anxiety by keeping proper records associated with your existing account. 
Once you submit your registration form, you will receive an email from the Arts Grants mailbox. This email will contain your username and a system-generated temporary password. The temporary password is only good for 24 hours, so please finish setting up your account as soon as you receive the email. Your username will be in the following format, first name dot last name. This will not change. The first time you log into eGrants, you will need to change the temporary password and set up security questions, which will be used in case you forget your password. Password requirements include, it must be at least eight characters, one of which must be a numeric character, and it cannot be the same as your username or your original default password. Make a note of your new password, as well as your security questions and answers as you will need these to reset your password. Like summer, passwords do not last forever. If you have not been in the eGrants system for 90 days or more, you will need to reset your password. This is a view of the login page for the eGrants system. Note that underneath the field for your password are links to use if you have forgotten your username and or password. We will talk more about those links in a few moments. After you have successfully logged in, this is the page you will see. It is your home page while in the eGrants system. Let's say you already have an account, but have either forgotten your password or it has expired. No worries. When you get to the eGrants login page, as noted earlier, you will see at the bottom of the page a link for Forgot Your Username or Password. Click on the link for Password and follow the prompts to reset your password. This is where you will need to use your security questions and answers. Remember, it's a good idea to keep track of those since we cannot help you with restoring them. You have three attempts to access your account, after which your account will be disabled. At that point, you'll need to contact the Grants Administration Unit, and we will have to reset your account. If you have forgotten or mislaid your security questions and answers, you will also have to contact us for a reset. For resets we do, we will either contact you directly with a new temporary password or prompt the New York.gov system to send you an email with the temporary password. Remember that temporary passwords are only good for 24 hours, so do not delay in changing your password. Now that you have an account, it's on to navigating the eGrants system. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Mark. In this section of the webinar, we will look at the process of creating an application in the eGrants system, including the various forms you need to complete, both in electronic and paper formats. Once you are logged in, you will see the eGrants homepage. Click on the LGRMIF link to get you to any applications you've already created or to create a new application. This page will be your home base, as it were, where you can create an application as well as manage a grant. Here you will see a list of any previous applications that you started and any you submitted. Once you create a new application, it will be added to the list. When you wish to edit the new application, you need to access it by clicking on the appropriate project number in the list, not by hitting the Create an Application button. To create a new grant application, click on the Create New Application, the green button in the upper left corner highlighted on the slide. This button is used to create a new application only. Do not use it to edit an application that you have already created. When a new blank application appears, you will be directed to the application checklist. This will be your home page as you edit your application. In the application checklist, click on the initial application bar to begin filling out the application. Here is a view of the application checklist menu. It is divided into three parts, initial application, final reporting, 
and the FS-10A amendments, which are optional. As noted earlier, we are only covering the initial application process in this webinar, so we will only be looking at the initial application link. Click on the initial application link to get to the next step, and we'll move on to crafting an application. The initial application menu provides access to all parts of the application. This includes the application sheet, project narrative, and project budget. Additionally, you can access the required paper forms, the institutional authorization, payee information forms, and the FS10 slash proposed budget. The menu also provides links to the shared services agreement form and the list of participating institutions, both of which are required for shared services applications. Through the menu, you can also access links to application printouts, which will provide instructions on printing parts of your application, instructions on how to attach and upload items to your application, the appendices A and A1G, which spell out contractual agreements when doing business with New York State, no need to submit these, you just need to be aware of them, pre-qualification pre requirements for not-for-profits, and MWBE requirements. In the following slides, we will look at the primary parts of the menu where you will be entering data into the eGrant system, namely the application sheet, project narrative, and project budget. We'll also look at application printouts and attaching items to your application. Later on, we'll talk about specific forms. Mark will begin with the application sheet. Thank you, Sarah. The application sheet is where you enter certain information about your institution and your proposed project. The top, part, the top part of the form, seen here, is automatically populated with data about your institution drawn from the Education Department's client database, CEDREF. You cannot edit any of this information. If any information needs to be updated, such as the name of your CEO or an address, you need to submit a standard data capture form to the grants unit. Once we receive that form, we will update your record in CEDREF. We strongly encourage you to verify this information prior to submitting an application. The data capture form is available through our website on our eGrants Apply for a Grant webpage. We'll provide the web address at the end of this presentation for that page. The middle part of the application sheet, seen here, has fields on whether you are a New York City agency and eligibility requirements, such as when you appointed an RMO and adopted the local government retention schedule. This is also where you include information on your RMO and project director. Be sure to enter current and correct email addresses for these individuals. Important information regarding your application will be sent to these emails, so proofread them before saving the form. You will also enter information about your institution not contained in your CEDREF record, such as your region. Be sure to enter the correct one. If you are uncertain of your region, visit the archives website and click on the Contact Us link, then click on the Regional Advisory Officer list to find which counties comprise a region. In this part of the application sheet, there is also a drop-down menu for the type of institution you are, such as town, village, BOCES, etc. Select the correct one. The bottom part of the sheet contains fields regarding the type of application and project category you are submitting. Click on the correct radio button for either an individual or shared services application type. Use the drop-down menu to select your project category. The population served annual operating budget and number of employee fields are no longer needed. They have been eliminated from the application sheet. The slide shows an earlier version of the application sheet. The very bottom of the application sheet also has a text field for a project summary seen here, which is limited to 2,500 characters. Use this field to provide a concise summary of your proposed project, highlighting your records management issues and the proposed solutions to those issues. An important note on this form, 
all fields must be completed during the same session before you will be able to save any data. You cannot complete it in a piecemeal way. Fill in all of the required fields first before saving the form. If you are unsure of any data, use a placeholder and then hit save or confirm the data before you complete the form. Also note that the eGrant system is set up to time out after 30 minutes of inactivity, so save often. But for this form only, you need to enter data into all the required fields before you can save anything. Next, Sarah will talk about the project narrative. To access the project narrative from the application sheet, click on the forms link on the toolbar at the top of the application sheet page. This will take you back to the initial application sheet checklist. From there, click on the project narrative link. The project narrative is the most important part of your application and it's worth 80% of your application score. This is the part of the application where you will describe and explain your records management issues and your proposed solutions in sufficient detail to convince the reviewers you have a viable project. The narrative consists of four sections. One, statement of the problem. Two, intended results. Three, plan of work. And four, local government support. Sections one through three are worth a maximum of 25 points each. Section four is worth a maximum of five points. Each section has a subsection. Address each of these subsections being as detailed as possible. The narrative directly corresponds to the criteria that reviewers will follow when scoring your application. Each subsection contains instructions on what you need to address and what specific information you need to include in that subsection. Click on the link for more instructions where specified. In the instructions, click on the link for category requirements general and specific, for more information on the requirements that all applicants must address and the specific category requirements that must be addressed for that particular category. In certain subsections, in order to access the requirements link, you need to first click on the link for more instructions. You can navigate from subsection to subsection by clicking on the links in the menu on the left. Be sure to save any changes in the subsection you are working in before you navigate out of it. Remember, the system will kick you out after 30 minutes of inactivity, so save often. In the next slide, we'll discuss entering and editing text in the narrative text fields. You can type directly into the various text fields, but it is better to create the text in a separate Word document creating the formatting you want, and then copy and paste that text into the appropriate narrative subsection. The narrative text fields do contain a word editing toolbar at the top of the text field, but it is only accessible if you have JavaScript enabled on your computer. If you don't see the editing toolbar, then you don't have JavaScript enabled on your device. You can still enter and save text, however, but you won't have access to the formatting tools in the editing toolbar. Only text, including tables, can be entered into the narrative. You cannot enter data in certain file formats, such as spreadsheets and digital photos. You may add items in these formats as attachments to your application, however. We will discuss attachments in a later slide. Now, Mark will guide you through the project budget. Thank you again, Sarah. To access the project budget, either click on the forms link in the toolbar or the checklist link, which takes you back to the initial application checklist. A project budget is worth 20% of your application score. Here you will provide detailed information on your proposed expenditures. Reviewers evaluate your proposed budget based on how well you justify all expenditures as being necessary and reasonable. The project budget consists of nine budget codes, as seen in this slide. Click on the appropriate link at the top of the project budget page to access any of the budget codes. Each budget code has two parts, a budget table and a budget narrative. The upper part contains the budget table, 
with fields to enter data such as the names of staff and vendors, descriptions of the services to be obtained, and the supplies or materials to be bought, as well as the amount of the proposed expenditures, among other fields. To add a record to any budget code, click on the Add button in the upper left. For each appropriate budget code, enter all relevant information for all expenditures associated with your proposed project. Be sure to enter the appropriate amount in the Amount Requested field. Be sure to check your math, as the system will not calculate data. Also, be sure to save your work often. The Save button for the budget table is at the bottom of your last record. Complete only budget codes that apply to your project. Do not include your local government's contributions on any of the budget forms. Include this information in the project narrative. Be sure to delete any empty records by clicking on the blue Delete button in the bottom left of each record. The system requires that any record created have data entered into it. If there is an error in any of the budget codes after you hit the Save button, you will receive a red error message giving details on what needs to be corrected. This slide shows where you can access help at any time while working on your project budget. Click on the Project Budget Help link and you will be taken to a PDF of the eGrants Applicant User Manual. Each budget code contains this link. This slide shows a sample of a single line item in the Professional Salaries Budget Code, or Code 15. Note that the amount in the gray box matches the amount requested, $2,700. But the amount in the gray box, which is labeled Hours Pay Rate in Code 15, is filled in by the system after one has entered a figure in the Amount Requested box. Next, we'll look at the budget narrative. The budget narrative is in the bottom half of the project budget page. This is where you will provide detailed, specific information on each proposed expenditure for your project. Reviewers will be looking for information justifying the reasonableness and necessity of each proposed cost. Similar to the project narrative, the budget narrative also has a word editing toolbar. Again, you need to have JavaScript enabled in order to see and use the toolbar. You can also copy and paste text into the budget narrative, but you cannot paste in spreadsheets and digital images. You can copy and paste tables that were created in a Word document. Note that the budget narrative has a separate Save button from the budget table. It is located at the top of the text box above the editing toolbar. Also remember to save your work often. Each budget code has instructions on what you need to include in the budget narrative. These instructions are above the Save button. After the instructions is a link to eligible, ineligible expenditures and other forms. Click on this link to find instructions on what expenditures are eligible or ineligible for each budget code. Be sure you review these lists before making any entries in your project budget. Once you have completed and saved your project budget, the system will automatically populate the data into the FS10 slash proposed budget. More on that form later. As a reminder, if you need help at any time you are completing the project budget, click on the Project Budget Help link just above the name of the budget code at the top of the project budget page. Sarah will next walk us through the process of obtaining application printouts and attachments. Thank you, Mark. You can print out a complete application or individual components of your application. To get to the application printouts, go to the LGRMIF Initial Application Forms menu and click on the Application Printouts link. It's the third one from the bottom. This will take you to a page listing the parts of an application in HTML or PDF formats. Note that you can print the whole application in an HTML format only. You can Access the application printouts page by clicking on the forms link in the toolbar. Clicking on that link will always return you to the initial applications forms menu. 
You can also use the Application Printouts feature to save the format on your computer. For the HTML format, put your cursor anywhere on the page and right-click your mouse, then click Save As. Name the file and pick a place to save it. For the PDF format, download the document. When prompted to either open in Adobe or save file, choose open in Adobe. This will open an editable version of the document. Click on file in the toolbar, name the file, and choose a place to save it. Let's move on to attaching documents to your application. Certain documents must be attached to your application. These include, but are not limited to, the Shared Services Agreement form for Shared Services projects only. They're printed out, completed, signed, and uploaded. Needs assessments, which are eligible only for the inactive records and the historical records projects. Vendor treatment proposals, which are required for certain projects in the historical records category. Floor plans, which are required for certain inactive records and historical records program, projects. Request for quotes, also known as RFQs, when they're required, and MWE forms, which the Education Department's MWE unit requires to be submitted electronically only. You may also wish to add items such as the photographs of a current storage area to strengthen the argument for your proposed project. There are restrictions, however, on the kinds of file formats that you can attach. Supporting documentation must be submitted in any one of the following formats only. For text-based documents, Microsoft Word 2007 or 2010 DOCX documents only are allowed, as well as PDF. For spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets formatted as XLSX files. For images, JPEGs, bitmaps, or PNGs. Please note that we cannot accept MS Word 2003.doc files. They must be converted to MS Word 2007 or 2010. You are responsible for ensuring that the documentation required for the specific application type or category you are applying for is attached to your application. If possible, obtain electronic versions of any documentation required from a vendor, such as needs assessments, responses to RFQs, and floor plans and shelving layouts. You are also responsible for ensuring your attachments conform to eGrants file format standards, are not corrupted, and can be viewed by reviewers. The Archives recommends that applicants download each of their files after uploading them to eGrants to verify that they can be opened and read. To attach items to your application, Go to the Initial Application Forms menu and select the Attachments slash Uploads link. As a reminder, you access the Initial Application Forms menu by clicking on either the Forms or Checklist links in the top toolbar. Click on the Add an Attachment in the lower left-hand corner. On the Add an Attachment page, click on Browse to navigate to where you've saved your file on your computer. Highlight the file name and click OK. Please use a meaningful name for your document, as this will be the name saved to eGrants. Remember to make it easy for reviewers to locate the file. Enter a short description of the document, and then click Upload to save the document directly to your application. After you click Upload, you will remain on the Add an Attachment page, so you can continue to add as many files as you need. Be sure your attachments adhere to the eGrants requirements noted in the previous slide. At any point in this process, you can click on the View List of Attachments link at the bottom of the Add an Attachment page to check on your progress. To get back to the Add an Attachment page, click on the Add an Attachment link. To delete any items, go to the List of Attachments and click on the Delete link to the left of the item. You will then be prompted to confirm the deletion. Now that you've completed your application, it's time to submit. When you are sure your initial application is complete and accurate, you've proofread your narrative, you've checked your math three times, all of your attachments are complete and readable, and your required paper forms are ready to be mailed, then it's finally time to hit the Submit button. Note, you cannot edit the application once you have submitted it, so make sure that everything is accurate and complete before you submit. 
To access the Submit button, go to the Initial Application Forms menu. At the bottom of that page is a big blue bar that says Submit Initial Application. Hit that button to begin the submission process. You will next see a page confirming that you want to submit. This page will also remind you about the submission of the required paper forms that must be mailed and postmarked by the application deadline. If your application is incomplete, such as missing parts of the narrative, the project budget, or the application sheet, you will see red error messages on this page. The messages will tell you what needs to be completed in order to submit the initial application. Return to any incomplete section and correct the error. Then return to the Submit Initial Application button. A note of caution, do not wait until the last minute or even the last 30 minutes to get around to submitting your application. You don't really have much room for error in the last few minutes before the 5 p.m. posted deadline. The system will lock everyone out precisely at 5 p.m. If you find you need to correct an error at the last minute, you may run out of time. So give yourself time to submit the application. The project director and RMO will receive an email confirming that the application has been submitted. You can also view the status of an application in eGrants. To check the status of your submitted application, go to the LGRMIF Initial Application Forms menu. At the bottom of that page is a link to View Application Submission. Clicking on that link will take you to a page that includes a table with the date the application was submitted and the name of the person who submitted it, which will be in the form of their username. In this example, you see that in the table there are two entries, one for the initial application and one for the final reports. When you submit the initial application, you will only see the top entry. Should you receive a grant, when you submit your required final reports, you will see the second entry. On the LGRMIF homepage, which contains a list of all applications started and submitted by your institution, you can also find a column indicating the status of any application, including ones that were not submitted. Once an application has been submitted, including the paper forms, by the posted deadline, it will be put forward for review. The results of that review process will not be released until the archives has received authorization to do so from the appropriate oversight agencies. At that point, all project directors and RMOs will be notified by email of their award status. Next up, Mark will review where to get help on completing your application. Thank you, Sarah. While you are working on your application, there will probably be times where you will need some help. And fortunately, we can provide it in a number of different places. On the LGRMIF homepage, shown here, there are two links to help choices in the upper right-hand corner under the Quick Links heading. The top link for the Help page will take you to a page in eGrants where you can access either the current application guidelines through the Archives LGRMIF webpage or another link to the User Manual. Clicking on the Creating or Accessing an Application Help link takes you directly to a PDF of the eGrants Applicant User Manual. On the eGrants homepage, seen here, you can also find a help link. Clicking on the LGRMIF application help link also takes you to a PDF of the eGrants applicant user manual. So you can look for help before you go any deeper into the eGrants system. You can also access the user manual from the archives LGRMIF web pages. We will show the address for that page in a slide at the end. When you get to the LGRMIF homepage on our website, click on the link for eGrants Apply for a Grant to access the manual. If you cannot find what you are looking for in any of the resources mentioned above, feel free to contact the Grants Administration Unit at archgrants at nised.gov. Individual parts of the application also have help links specific to that part of the application. These include the pages for the application sheet, seen in this slide, project narrative, project budget, as noted earlier, and attachments. The shared services and participating institution list also have link help links on their respective pages. These links are at the top of the page, 
on the left-hand side, as seen here. They all take you to the PDF of the Applicant User Manual. We will next look at forms. But before we do that, a quick reminder on navigation in eGrants. Once you are in the Initial Application Forms menu, at the top of each page is a toolbar with the following links. Home, which takes you to the eGrants homepage, LJRMIF Home, which takes you to the list of applications, checklist, which is the menu for the initial application forms, final reporting, and the amendment section, and forms, which gets highlighted once you have clicked on a particular section of the initial application forms menu, such as you see in the current slide. You can use these links instead of your browser back button to get to different parts of the system. In addition to the application sheet, the project and budget narratives, there are a handful of other forms that are required to be submitted with your application. In our final segment of this presentation, we will take a brief look at these forms. All of these forms are accessible within the eGrant system, but not all of them can be completed within the eGrant system. This brief look will include both the required electronic and paper forms. As noted, this is a brief overview of the paper forms found in the eGrant system. For a more in-depth look at these forms, see module number five in this series, LGRMIF Application Forms and Tips. There are three paper forms that all applicants are required to submit with their applications. These are the Institutional Authorization Form, the Payee Information Form, or PI, with the W-9, and the FS-10 Proposed Budget. All the forms require the original signature of your CEO. The Institutional Authorization Form also requires the signature of your RMO. The Institutional Authorization provides proof that your institution will adhere to New York State's rules and regulations regarding receiving funding from the state. These are spelled out in the Appendices A and A1G. The PI form is required to ensure that the New York State Education Department can make payments to your local government if a grant is awarded. The W-9 is required only if you do not have a vendor ID issued by the State Controller's Office. A vendor ID is required in order to be paid, but the vast majority of local governments already have one. To verify that you have a vendor ID, check your institution's record in CEDREF, SED's client database. The FS-10 is required by the Education Department's Grants Finance Unit. This form is populated by data that you enter into the project budget which is why it is always best to use the version of the form located in eGrants. You can access all of these forms from the LJRMIF Initial Application Forms menu. Click on the link for the particular form, print out the form, and include the appropriate signatures before you put them in the mail. The Institutional Authorization Form and the FS-10 are all populated with data appropriate to your institution and to your project. You only need to print out, sign, and date these forms. The PI form is not populated with any data from your eGrants application. You will need to either in enter information into that form from outside of the eGrants system, either by hand or in a Word document. These paper forms are required to be submitted in a hard copy because they require original signatures from your CEO and in the case of the institutional authorization, your RMO. All three of these forms must be postmarked no later than the posted application deadline. Give yourself plenty of time to get the forms in the mail and postmark. They must be submitted with original signatures. No stamped signatures or any other kind of facsimile version of a signature will be accepted. Applications with anything other than original signatures will be considered incomplete and will not be forwarded for review. 
You should also mail all three forms at the same time. If any form is missing by the posted application deadline, the application will be considered incomplete and will not be put forward for review. Mail the forms directly to the Grants Administration Unit of the New York State Archives. Our address can be found in the eGrants system, as noted in an earlier slide, as well as in the current application guidelines. Please also note that these are the only forms that need to be mailed to us. All the other forms are submitted electronically. There is no need to mail us a copy of your project narrative or any attachments. You should electronically attach any documents that are relevant to your application, as the reviewers will only have electronic access to your application. Remember, you are responsible for making sure that your application is accurate and complete. Up next, Sarah will touch briefly on the two forms required for shared services. In addition to the forms already discussed, shared services projects have two additional forms that they also need to submit. One is the shared services agreement form, and the other is the participating institution list. We'll look at each in the following slides. The shared services agreement form is submitted by participating institutions in a shared services project. The form is accessible from the LGRMIF Initial Application Forms menu. It is available in both an HTML and PDF format. The form is populated with the name of the sponsoring or lead institution and the project number. The form needs to be printed and the participating institution inserts its name on the form and has its CEO sign and date the form. The form should then be forwarded to the lead institution and uploaded to their application. All participating institutions must submit a shared services agreement form as part of the requirements of a shared services application. The lead institution is responsible for ensuring that all participating institutions have submitted the form and that they have been uploaded to their application. The participating institution list is completed by the lead institution. This form is an electronic form and is automatically part of your shared services application once you complete it. It does not require a signature. You can access it from the LGRMIF Initial Application Forms menu. You will be taken to a page where you enter a name in a search field and hit Search. Once you have found the correct institution, click the Add button. After you click Add, the name will appear above the search button in a list. Do this for each participating institution. If you need to delete an institution, you can hit the individual Delete button in the far right of your saved list. You can also edit the institution's record by hitting the Edit button just to the left of the Delete button. In the list of saved institutions, there are fields for indicating whether a retention schedule was adopted, the year it was adopted, whether an RMO was appointed, and the year an RMO was appointed. Once you've completed your list, the system automatically saves it. This list draws from the CEDREF database. If you cannot find an institution, it does not have a record in CEDREF. If you need to have an institution added to CEDREF, contact the Grants Administration Unit at archgrants.nyced.gov. Next up are the Appendices A and A1G. When your CEO and your RMO sign the Institutional Authorization Form, they are certifying that your local government agrees to the conditions outlined in Appendix A and A1G, should you be awarded a grant. These appendices outline legal requirements that must be adhered to by all entities doing business with and receiving funds from New York State. They are automatically part of your application, so you can have access to them. They do not need to be submitted as part of your application, so please do not mail them back to us as part of your paper forms. To read the appendices, click on the link for them in the LGRMIF Initial Application Forms menu. This will take you to a page with links to them on the top. Those links will take you to the HTML versions on our website. Note that this is the same page where you can access the payee information form. And now, Mark will wrap things up for us. Thank you again, Sarah. Let's summarize some of the things we've covered in this presentation. First, you need to have a user account before you can access eGrants. 
only one account is allowed per institution, and that account is set up only through your RMO. Once you get an account, keep track of your account credentials. Remember, the RMO can delegate those credentials as they see fit. Make sure your institution's basic information, such as address and name of CEO, are correct before beginning an application. If not, submit an updated standard data capture form to the grants unit, which is accessible from our LGRMIF web pages. Once you create an application, do not hit the Create button to edit the application. Click on the appropriate project number instead. For the narratives, you can enter text directly into the application, but it is strongly recommended that you work out your particular narrative in a separate Word document and copy and paste into eGrants. Remember to save your work often. The system times out after 30 minutes of inactivity. Make sure your math is correct and that all appropriate documents are attached to your application and accessible to reviewers. Remember, you alone are responsible for making sure your application is complete and accurate and that you have provided sufficient and detailed information to convince reviewers that your proposed project is viable. Keep in mind that you cannot edit the application once it has been submitted. Be sure to have all required paper forms with the appropriate original signatures postmarked no later than the posted deadline. Finally, be sure to give yourself plenty of time to complete and submit your application. This includes not only the electronic components, but also the paper forms. Do not wait until the last minute to try and submit the electronic portion. The system will lock you out at the posted deadline time with no chance for leeway. Also keep in mind that a complete application consists of both the electronic forms and the required paper forms. If either or both parts are not submitted by the posted application deadline, the application will be considered incomplete and not be put forward for review. And one last thing, don't forget to breathe. As a reminder, this is the third of six modules in our LGRMIF grant application training series. You are encouraged to view all of them and view them in order. You certainly don't have to, but doing so will give you a more complete and better understanding of the LGRMIF application process and assist you in creating a stronger application. Thank you for joining us in this webinar. We hope you found it helpful. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact the Grants Unit either by email or by phone. We also recommend that you look at our LGRMIF web pages, including the specific eGrants page for more information on the system. Feel free to also contact your Regional Advisory Officer, or RAO, to discuss the particulars about any proposed project. Thank you again and good luck with your project.